Well, good morning again. Today is October 31st, which will be celebrated as Halloween, but Christians need to know something else about this date. Now, look, I realize that for some of you, I might be a little bit of an oddball. I read historical biographies in my free time. I realize that a lot of people aren't in the history lessons. So I get that, but I want to ask you to hang with me, because on October 31st, 1517, 504 years ago, a German monk named Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door of the castle church in Wittenberg, Germany. And for that reason, Christians also remember October 31st as Reformation Day. I appreciate that, man. I appreciate that. Now, at the time of Martin Luther, here's why that's a big deal. The vast majority of Christians were Roman Catholic, but Luther launched something that became known as the Protestant Reformation because he was protesting against ways that he believed the Roman Catholic Church had gone against the teaching of the Bible. And Luther challenged the Roman Catholic Church about the Pope, the priesthood, and the sacramental system. Now, just to be clear, I'm not planning on going into a discussion of the difference between Protestants and Catholics today. This was 504 years ago, and a lot has changed. If you're struggling with that, maybe you have a family member that's a Roman Catholic, I'd love to have a much more detailed conversation with you another time. But I'm talking about what happened 504 years ago, and that's why Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to that door. Now, here's a common question that Christians get asked, right? Why are there so many denominations? Why are there so many denominations of Christians? Well, Martin Luther didn't actually start out trying to start a new Christian denomination, but he was rejected by the Roman Catholic Church. And eventually it became clear that there was no way forward. And so him and his followers broke off, and over time, Protestantism formed into a distinct movement. So today, Protestant denominations like Methodism, Presbyterianism, Anglicanism, and Baptists, like us, should trace our heritage back to Martin Luther and what happened on October 31st, 1517 in some way. So that's why you should care about this history lesson. If you're here in a Baptist church in 2021, then what happened on October 31st, 1517 matters for you. Now, you might wonder, what was the Protestant Reformation all about? And by the way, it's going to be eight years before October 31st is a Sunday again. You've got to take advantage. So what was the Reformation about? Well, one helpful way to summarize the teaching of the Reformation is known as the five solas. And they're called the five solas because each one is a Latin phrase. Now, I actually don't read Latin, but I'll give you the translation. So the first of the five is sola scriptura, by scripture alone. So according to the advocates for the Protestant Reformation and according to us today, the Bible is the final authority for what Christians should believe and how we should live, by Scripture alone. Second, sola fide, by faith alone. God saves sinners only through faith, not because of any good works they've done, not because they've lived up to any moral standard. God saves sinners by faith and by faith alone. Sola gratia. By grace alone. God saves people by his grace because they're undeserving sinners. So salvation is a gift by grace alone. Solus Christus or Solo Christo, Christ alone. God accomplishes salvation through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. We sang in Christ alone this morning. Soli Deo Gloria, fifth and last one, glory to God alone. So God and God alone deserves glory and praise for everything that he's done. 
So that's what the Reformation was about. So I would encourage you today to remember October 31st, 1517. And in some way, Protestant Christians like us today should celebrate that date. But like I said, one of the five tenets of the Reformation was by Scripture alone. And so we'll stop the history lesson and let's get to the Bible because that's what we believe we need to hear from today. This is the sixth week of our eight-week series on the parables of Jesus and Luke. I've titled that series, The Secrets of the Kingdom of God, because the parables aren't just interesting stories, but Jesus actually used them to communicate truths about the eternal kingdom of God. Our sermon text this morning is the parable of the dishonest manager, a tricky one. And it's Luke 16, verses 1 through 13. I think you need to know something about this parable. In my opinion, this is one of Jesus' hardest parables to understand. So some parables, like the parable of the Good Samaritan, are straightforward in many ways. The hard part is applying it to our lives. The parable of the dishonest manager is hard to apply And it's hard to understand. I think so. Now, maybe you'll disagree. Maybe the meaning of this parable is obvious to you already. But I think it's one of Jesus' hardest parables to understand. But I think it's going to be worth our time this morning. Because when it is understood, it communicates a powerful message about how we should use our resources as disciples of Jesus Christ. So if you have a copy of the Bible, turn to Luke 16, verses 1 through 13, if you haven't already. If you don't have a copy of the Bible with you this morning, there's a black pew Bible in the pew in front of you that looks like this, and you can find Luke 16, verses 1 through 13, on page 875 in that pew Bible, page 875. Again, Luke 16, 1 through 13, and will you stand with me for the reading of the Word of God? Luke 16, beginning in verse 1. He also said to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be a manager. And the manager said to himself, What shall I do, since my master is taking the management away from me? I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do, so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, how much do you owe my master? He said, a hundred measures of oil. He said to him, take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. Then he said to another, how much do you owe? He said, a hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and write 80. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much, and one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. You may be seated. In first century Palestine, wealthy individuals often had managers, also called stewards, 
who were in charge of their property. But the rich man in this parable had a problem. His manager was mismanaging his property and losing him money. So he calls in his steward and fires him. Now the steward has a problem. He's unemployed. And if you were fired in first century Palestine, you couldn't just submit your resume to a different company. Remember, this is 2,000 years ago. Most likely, the steward probably lived on the property of his rich boss, so he was likely out of a job and out of a home. He has a big problem. And the manager is honest about his prospects. According to him, he isn't going to work with his hands, and he's too proud to beg. So as you can see, this manager is not a particularly likable person. He's not very good at his job. He's too proud to do the work that other people do. But he saw an opportunity. His boss asked him to do one more thing before he left. Make a final record of all of his responsibilities. In other words, put together a transition plan. So the manager comes up with his plan to secure a future for himself. So the steward calls in everyone that owes his boss money, and he asks them how much they owe. Then he reduced their debts. So the person who owed a hundred jugs of olive oil, which was an enormous debt, now only owed 50. And the person who owed 100 measures of wheat, also an enormous debt, now only owes 80. And if you're tracking with the story, you see who they owe the other 50 and 20 to, to the steward. So the steward has taken his boss's debtors out of his boss's debt and put them in his debt. New Testament scholars estimate that this steward probably saved each of his boss's debtors between two to three years of wages at that time. So we're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars today because the steward probably did this with more than two people. You see, when the manager was finally cut loose, when he turned over the record of his management, he would have some serious favors to call in. And that's the heart of his plan. Now, what's strange about this parable is since he just cheated his boss out of hundreds of thousands of dollars, you would expect the parable to end with the rich man being angry, confronting the steward, trying to hold him accountable in some way. But that's not how the story ends. If you look at verse 8, the boss compliments the manager for his wisdom, for his cleverness, for his shrewdness. And then the parable ends. Jesus told this parable to his disciples. I think you can imagine them being amused, maybe even laughing by the unexpected ending. And this is why the parable of the dishonest manager is so hard to understand. Jesus says in verses 8 and 9 that the dishonest manager is an example to follow, which is very confusing. Because he's everything that Christians are not supposed to be. He's proud, he's lazy, he's self-centered, and he's dishonest. So Christians should be like that. That's a confusing way to end the parable. So what is Jesus getting at? Why would Jesus tell his disciples to learn from a dishonest manager? Well, to answer that question... We have to look very closely at three things that Jesus said about the manager. First, if you look at verse 8, Jesus said that the rich man praised his manager for one specific thing, being clever. Verse 8 says, the master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. So, Christians should imitate one very specific thing about the dishonest manager, his strategic thinking. 
his cleverness. Michael Jordan showed incredible work ethic, determination, and competitive drive in his NBA career. He's a great role model. But in other ways, Michael Jordan wasn't so great of a role model. He was a gambler, he was unkind to his teammates, and he was proud. But those flaws don't change the fact that his competitiveness, his work ethic, his drive, those are things worthy of imitation. In a similar way, Jesus is pointing out one thing for Christians to imitate about the dishonest manager, his cleverness. In other words, disciples of Jesus should imitate the cleverness of the manager, not his character. Imitate his cleverness, not his character. The second thing that we need to pay attention to is also in verse 8. Because Jesus said that non-Christians sometimes act with more skill in their business dealings than Christians do in their affairs. Verse 8 says, For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. You see, people who are worldly realize how powerful their resources are and they leverage them to accomplish their goals. I know you've heard the stories of the entrepreneurs who come up with incredibly visionary plans, and they make sacrifices, and they work, and they work, and they work to accomplish their goals. Steve Jobs, Jeff Bezos, and many, many others. But here's what Jesus is saying. Shouldn't my disciples display the same level of strategic thinking, and trying to advance the goals of my kingdom? That's what Jesus is saying. Shouldn't my disciples display the same ingenuity, the same work ethic, the same determination in advancing my goals as people do in their business dealings out in the world? Here's the third thing we need to see. In verse 9, Jesus says that we should use our wealth and resources in this life to secure a future for ourselves in eternity. Verse 9 says, And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. Dave Ramsey, the personal finance guru, is famous for saying, If you will live like no one else, later you can live like no one else. In other words, the best thing that you can do for yourself financially is make some sacrifices in the short term so that you can benefit from those sacrifices in the long term. Jesus is applying that type of financial advice to the kingdom of God. The steward in the parable realized that the best thing he could do with the temporary resources he had access to, in the parable, he only had access to his boss's money for maybe a few more hours, maybe a few more days. The best thing he could do was take those temporary resources and secure a permanent future for himself. So he used someone else's money to make his friends. Jesus is saying, by analogy, You should follow that example and use the resources that you have in your life, the temporary resources, for a greater purpose. In other words, Jesus is saying, use some sanctified common sense. Use your common sense. Your resources, they're not going to last. So use them for something that will last. That's what Jesus is saying. So to sum it all up, Jesus is saying that we should follow the example of the dishonest steward by following his cleverness, not his character, and leveraging our resources for eternal purposes. You know, Christians have something in common with the manager. We're stewards. We're managers. Because everything that we have doesn't finally belong to us. All the resources we have are ultimately God's. If we have money, it's his, not ours. 
It's his. If we have gifts, they're his. They're not ours. They're his. If we have time and energy, it's his. It's not ours. So, since we're managers, we have to be asking the question, how does God want us to use his resources? How does God want us to use his resources? So, as you can see, the, the parable of the dishonest manager doesn't have a lot to teach you about integrity. But it has a lot to teach you about the decisions we make every day. How do we leverage our temporary resources for the purposes of God? Now, after he tells the parable, Jesus gives three ways that Christians should act with their resources. And that's what I want to spend the rest of our time talking about. And here are the three ways. Christians should be clever, Christians should be faithful, and Christians should be devoted with their resources. So Christians should be clever, faithful, and devoted with their resources. So first, clever. Here's a question for each of us to answer in light of this parable. What resources has God given to us, and how can we use them for eternal purposes? So answer that question for yourself. Has God given you money? Has God given you intellectual musical, or athletic gifts? Has God given you time? Has God given you friendships and connections? Has God given you specific training and skills? Has God given you the benefit of life experience? What resources has God given to you, and how can you leverage them for eternal purposes? When you answer that question, be clever like the manager. Be strategic. Use your resources to accomplish the goals of the kingdom of God. To do this, you might have to come up with a plan. If you're married, you might have to sit down with your spouse. If you're single, you might have to talk to a trusted friend. Didn't the steward come up with a plan? You have to identify what resources has God given to you, and how can you leverage those for eternal purposes? I love it when Jesus appeals to my common sense. I hope you do too. Because the reality is, in the busyness and distraction of this world, common sense is anything but common, in my life and in the lives of other people. So I love it when Jesus just speaks directly to my common sense. Jesus simply says in verse 9 that all the resources we have will eventually disappear. They're all temporary. And when that happens, the only thing you'll be left with are the eternal things that you invested your temporary resources in. So leveraging our temporary resources for eternal purposes is the smart thing to do. Now, don't misunderstand Jesus. Jesus is making a simple point in this parable. Jesus is not saying that you can buy your salvation. Jesus is not saying that you can earn your salvation by the way you spend your resources. That's not Jesus's point. I mean, today is Reformation Day. By faith alone, by grace alone, by Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. When you look at the teaching of the whole Bible, the only way that anyone is saved is through faith and repentance in Jesus Christ. But the Bible is also clear that the way that saved people leverage their resources in this life matters in eternity. The way that people leverage their resources in this life matters for eternity. 1 Timothy 6.19 says this, as for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, 
thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of what is truly life. So, brothers and sisters, Jesus wants us to be strategic with what he's given us and to use it for eternal purposes. You know, if you're not a Christian and you're listening to this, the parable of the dishonest manager should challenge you to think long-term. According to our culture, you should chase what makes you happy now. According to our culture, you should live for your goals, your dreams, your future. And what really matters is what you can touch. What really matters is what you can taste. What really matters is what you can see today. But 1 John 2, 17 says, the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. So if you're not a Christian, the clear message of this parable for you is start thinking about eternity. Start thinking about eternity. True life is more than you can taste right now. True life is more than you can see, more than you can feel in the here and now. So start thinking about eternity. C.T. Studd famously said, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. So the first thing that Jesus teaches us about stewarding his resources is that we must be clever. And the second is that we must be faithful. People love to ask questions like, what would you do if you had $20 million? What would you do if you had $20 million? Well, according to Jesus, you do the same thing as if you had $20. According to Jesus, you would do the same thing with $20 million that you would do with $20. Because when someone's bank account changes, it doesn't change their character. No matter how much money you have, the important question is character. Verse 10 of our passage says, one who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. By the way, this is why we have to read the Bible in context. So if you take the parable of the dishonest manager and then you go and cheat your boss out of thousands of dollars and then justify it off of that parable, I don't think you read verse 10, okay? We have to read the Bible in context. Jesus says that whether you are faithful or not doesn't depend on how much you have. It depends on who you are. So regardless of your financial situation, Jesus' words matter for you. Because he makes it clear that the most important question isn't how much money you have, and it isn't how much you have of any other resource. It's whether or not you're faithful with what you do have. So, kids, this morning, if your parents have given you some money, you're responsible to Jesus for how you steward it, whether it's a big amount, whether it's a little amount. And adults, whether you have a lot or a little, the question is faithfulness. And of course, this doesn't just apply to money. It applies to any of the resources that God has given us. Every Christian has different amounts of free time. Every Christian has different gifts from the Lord. Every Christian has a different personality. Every Christian has different opportunities and comes from a different background. But every Christian is called to the same standard. Faithfulness. Being faithful with what they have. So, if you look around and feel like God has entrusted you with less than he's given to other people, it's important to remember that we're all called to the same standard, faithfulness. And if you look around and feel like God has entrusted you with more than he has other people, it's important to remember we're all called to the same standard, faithfulness. By God's grace, we have a couple men here at First Southern who are exploring a call to vocational ministry. 
And among other things, I've shared Luke 16, verse 10 with them. Why? Because if you're exploring a call to ministry, the best thing that you can do is to be faithful with the, with the opportunities that God has given you now. Why would anyone want you to serve in vocational ministry if you're bad at volunteer ministry? So this applies to every area of our life. We must be faithful with the resources that God has given to us. You know, there is a hard reality to face here. We have to be honest about life. Sometimes we're faithful with a little, but we don't receive a lot. Sometimes we're faithful in little, but our circumstances don't change, which is why it's important to take a close look at what Jesus says in verse 10. You'll see in verse 10 that Jesus doesn't promise that faithfulness in little always results in more. So a man who manages his smaller income carefully, wisely, and faithfully may never get the big break. And that's not what Jesus promises. But the whole point of this parable is that we should be seeking eternal rewards from God. The purpose of this parable is not so that we should be faithful in the short term to get short-term rewards. The point of this parable is that we should be faithful in the short term because our eyes are on eternity. Matthew 6, 19 through 21 says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal for where your treasure is there your heart will be also. So Christians should be clever with God's resources. We should be faithful with God's resources. And finally, we should be devoted. Verse 13 says, No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Christians must be devoted to God in the way we use our resources. Jesus says something here that seems obvious, right? You can't serve two rival gods at the same time. But if it's so obvious, why do people try to do it all the time? Why are there so many people who are trying to follow Christ in some parts of their life but they're also trying to please the gods of popularity, social status, or family? Why are there so many people who claim to follow Jesus Christ, but they're also worshiping the gods of athletic, vocational, or academic success? Why are there so many people who claim to follow Christ with their lives, but they're also living in obedience to the gods of money, sex, and power? It must not be that obvious. God created us to be worshipers. He created us to worship him, but we sin by worshiping other things. In an ugly display of irony, we're tempted to take the resources that God has given us and worship the resources, not the God who's given them to us. And part of the reason why is because we love to worship things that we feel like we can control. We love to worship things that we feel like we can set the terms of the relationship. We love to worship things that we feel like we can own and things that give us satisfaction, we think, in the here and now. Now, obviously, the irony is that when we start to worship those things because we think that we can control them, they start to control us, and they become the God of our life. In Matthew 22, 37, Jesus said that the greatest commandment was, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And brothers and sisters, that is the cornerstone of biblical financial advice. That is the cornerstone of personal finance, according to the Bible, and how you steward every other resource that God has given to 
Now, if you're listening and you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, I've already spoken to you this morning, but I want to say something else. Jesus makes it absolutely clear in this passage that everyone has a master. So if you're not following Jesus Christ, it doesn't mean that you're living a free, independent life and making your own way. In fact, you're trapped by your own desires. So Jesus offers freedom, but it's a freedom in submitting to him. We all will have a God. It's simply a question of which one. And if you're here and you're not a Christian, I would love to talk to you after the service and explain to you why Jesus is the only God worth having. So Christians should be clever, faithful, and devoted with their resources. So on the one hand, we must be strategic and thoughtful with our resources, and faithfully manage them. On the other hand, we have to be devoted to God alone, and we can never cross the line into worshiping what God has given to us. You know, let's be honest, I think that's a difficult balance to maintain at times. You know, the Bible doesn't give us simplistic financial advice. The Bible actually encourages us to be strategic and faithful to maximize what God has given us. But the Bible also warns us that it's a thin line between strategy and obsession. It's a thin line between leveraging our resources for eternal purposes and satisfying ourselves with things that were meant for God's kingdom. So, brothers and sisters, this is why we must be committed students of the Bible, even passages of the Bible that are hard to understand. Because the goal of every Christian should be to submit to everything that Jesus teaches. You know, on the first week of this sermon series, I explained that Jesus' parables conceal, they reveal, and they always create a response. I want to show you how one group of people responded to Jesus' parable, because it's a warning to us. If you look at verse 14, the verse immediately after our sermon text, Luke 16, 14 says, the Pharisees, listen to this, who were lovers of money, heard all these things, and they ridiculed him. So tragically, while Jesus' disciples were having the secrets of the kingdom of God revealed to them, the Pharisees were making fun of Jesus. The Pharisees were saying, this guy just doesn't get it. This guy doesn't realize what money can do for you. This guy doesn't realize how good our lives are. But then look at what Jesus said to them. In verse 15, Jesus said, You are those who justify yourselves before men. But God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. So at the end of the day, when it comes to how we steward God's resources, we each have a question to ask ourselves. Do we care most about what God thinks? about how we steward our resources? Or do we care most about what people think? Are we going to live by the standards of God? Or are we going to live by the standards of the world? Let's pray. Father, I ask that you will make us a community of Christians who is strategic with our resources, who takes our stewardship seriously, who aspires to be faithful to you. But I also ask that you would make us a community of believers who is wholly, fully, and finally devoted to Christ and Him alone. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.